Section 1 of Stops, or How to Punctuate, a Practical Handbook for Writers and Students. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater And Step Heather Stops, or How to Punctuate, by Paul Allardyce, Section 1 Introduction The Use of Punctuation Punctuation is a device for making out the arrangement of a writer's ideas. Reading is thereby made easier than it otherwise would be. A writer's ideas are expressed by a number of words arranged in groups, the words in one group being more closely connected with one another than they are with those in the next group. An example will show this grouping in its simplest form. Example 1. He never convinces the reason, or fills the imagination, or touches the heart. To understand what is written, the reader must group the words together in the way intended by the writer, and in doing this he can receive assistance in various ways, partly by the inflection of the words, partly by their arrangement, partly also by punctuation. As to inflection we see in Latin an adjective and a substantive standing together, yet differing in gender, in number or in case, and we know that the adjective does not qualify the substantive. But English has not the numerous inflections of Latin. More scrupulous care, therefore, is needed in the arrangement of words in order to bring together in position such as are connected in meaning. Yet this is not always enough. Except in the very simplest sentences, there are generally several arrangements which are grammatically possible, and though all save one may be absurd in meaning, the reader may waver for a moment before the absurdity strikes him. Some artificial aid is thus needed to prevent him from thinking of any arrangement but the right one. There is no fault, for instance, to be found with the arrangement of the following words, yet, printed without points, they form a mere puzzle. Example 2 he had arrived already prepossessed with a strong feeling of the neglect which he had experienced from the Whigs, his old friends. However, all of them appeared ravished to see him, offered apologies for the mode in which they had treated him, and caught at him, as at a twig when they were drowning the influence of his talents they understood and were willing to see it thrown into the opposite scale. Of course, with a little effort the meaning can be discovered, but if such a little effort had to be put forth in every page of a whole book, reading would become a serious task. By means of points, or stops, we are spared much of this. The groups are presented ready-made to the eye, and the mind, bent in understanding the thought, is not distracted by having first to discover the connection of the words. The reader's task is more difficult where two or more ways of grouping the words not only are grammatically possible, but lead each to a more or less intelligible meaning. As a rule, he can find out from the context which way the writer meant him to take. One politician writes to another, I ask you, as the recognized leader of our party, what you think of this measure, and nobody accuses the writer of presumption. We might even pass over the following startling sentence without observing the reflection which it casts on a respectable body of men. Example 3. Hence he considered marriage with a modern political economist as dangerous. But when we read that the state may impose restrictions on the mothers of young children employed in factories, we may well have some doubt whether it is the mothers or the children who are employed in factories. And it would not be easy to give an answer if we were to state the precise meaning of Gray's line. Example 4 And all the air a solemn stillness holds. In longer and more involved sentences the risk of ambiguity is obviously much greater. Now by the judicious use of points, ambiguous language can occasionally be made clear. The mothers of young children employed in factories is no doubt a bold form, but it leaves us in no doubt as to the meaning. So the ambiguous word too does not embarrass us when we read, this problem too, easy as it may seem, remains unsolved. See other examples under rules 14 and 15. Only occasionally, however, can clearness be secured by punctuation. No pointing can help us much in Gray's line, or could have given to Pyrrhus the true reading of, 
Credo te aikida Romanos vincere posse. And even where it would make the meaning clear, it is a lazy device, the overuse of which is the sure sign of careless or unskilful composition. The true remedy for ambiguity is not punctuation, but rewriting. Punctuation, it is sometimes said, serves to mark the pauses that would be made in speaking. This is so far true, for by the pause we arrange our spoken words into proper groups, thereby enabling our hearers readily to seize the meaning. But between the punctuation of the pen and that of the voice, there is a great difference in degree. By the voice we can express the most delicate shades of thought, while only in the roughest way can the comma, the semicolon, and the other points imitate its effects. As to how far the attempt at imitation should be carried, every writer will have to use his own discretion. But whether we point freely or sparingly, we must for the reader's sake point consistently. It should at the same time be borne in mind that the lavish use of points often leads to confusion. General Rules Keeping in view the use of punctuation, we can now form two general rules to guide us when we are in doubt which point we should insert, or whether we should insert a point at all. Rule 1. The point that will keep the passage most free from ambiguity, or make it easiest to read, is the right point to use. Rule 2. If the passage be perfectly free from ambiguity, and be not less easy to understand without any point, let no point be used. The Relativity of Points in order to decide in any given case what point ought to be used, we begin by considering the nature of the pause in itself. But we must do more. We must consider how we have pointed the rest of the passage. The pause that should be marked by a comma in one case may require a semicolon in another case. The colon may take the place that the semicolon would generally fill. This will be best understood by means of the examples that will afterwards be given. See Rules 23, 25. Usage. Except within somewhat narrow limits, usage does not help us much. Different writers have different methods, and few are consistent. To some extent there is a fair degree of uniformity. For instance, in the placing of colons before quotations, and in the use of inverted commas. But in many cases there can hardly be said to be any fixed usage, and in these we can freely apply the general rules already laid down. Much might be said for a complete disregard of usage, for a thorough recasting of our system of punctuation. Sooner or later something must be done to relieve the overburdened comma of part of the work which it is expected to perform. Not only is the comma a less effective point than it might be, but the habit of using it for so many purposes is exercising a really mischievous effect on English style. In the meantime, as a step towards a better system, there is an evident advantage in giving to the existing vague usage a more or less precise form. Nothing more than this has been aimed at in the present work. In giving rules of punctuation, we cannot hope to deal with all, or with nearly all, the cases that may arise in writing. Punctuation is intimately connected with style. As forms of thought are infinite in number, so are the modes of expression, and punctuation, adapting itself to these, is an instrument capable of manipulation in a thousand ways. We can therefore set forth only some typical cases, forming a body of examples to which a little reflection will suggest a variety both of applications and of exceptions. It will be noticed that we do not take the points exactly in their order of strength. It seemed better to deal with a full stop before passing to the punctuation of the parts of a sentence. Again, it may be said that, strictly speaking, italics do not form part of the subject, but they are at any rate so intimately connected with it that to have passed them over would have been merely pedantic. Even the sections on references to notes and on the correction of proofs may not be considered altogether out of place. As few grammatical terms as possible have been made use of. Some have been found necessary in order to secure the brevity of statement proper to a little work on a little subject. End of section 1